Hi, I'm Dr. Jackson Crawford. I'm an Old Norse Specialist who teaches at the University of Colorado Boulder. It's been an unusually warm December here in Colorado. In fact, it's uh, December 17th or something as I'm filming this, and the uh, snow has only just fallen for the first time this year. Many cultures have a celebration during the time of year around the end of December when the days begin to get longer again and the Norse are no exception. Their holiday was called Yol, which also survives in the form of an English word Yule, which is cognate with the Norse word. In the modern Scandinavian countries, uh, the word has become Yule, other than in uh, modern Icelandic where the word is still Yol. This is a plural word and actually refers to a ceremony that took place over the course of three nights, beginning with midwinter night, so December 21st or 22nd by our reckoning, and then continuing the next three nights. We know that the festival contained a lot of feasting and drinking, although the specific actions that might have been undertaken are not so clear to us because our main sources for Norse mythology, such as the Poetic Edda and the Prose Edda, talk about myths, narratives, and stories, but very rarely about things like rituals and festivals and prayers. However, we can gain some hints by looking at some of the sagas in which Yule is celebrated, such as Hokonar Saga Goda, the saga of Hokon the Good, one of the kings of Norway. Now, Hokon the Good was king of Norway in the mid-900s, and he was a Christian, but he was not insistent about his religion. He wasn't a missionary. He was fine with some of his people remaining pagan. He only insisted that everyone in the kingdom celebrate a holiday in late December, whether that was Christmas or Yule, didn't matter. But he did stipulate legally that there was a minimum amount of alcohol that had to be consumed by each free man uh, to demonstrate that he was celebrating one of the holidays. And whereas uh, measurements in the, the sagas are not always very clear uh, or, or very strictly defined, uh, this amount, as near as I can figure, would be about four gallons over the course of those three nights, so a pretty considerable amount leading to the only culture I'm aware of in which you might have been pulled over by the cops for drinking too little. Now we also know that horse meat was apparently a big part of this festival. Uh, for instance, in the Saga of Hokon the Good, he attends a Yule festival thrown by one of his pagan subjects, and they insist at this feast that Hokon eat some of the meat of the horse, the horse's liver specifically. Hokon is very unwilling to do this, apparently because it's part of a pagan ceremony. But after a while, uh, with the help of a uh, sympathetic pagan follower, uh, he strikes a compromise and he simply inhales the smoke off of the cooked uh, horse liver, giving a new meaning to who inhaled. There's a moose down there by the creek. I don't think I could show it to you with the, uh, with the small as it would look on this camera, but that's cool. Well, the uh, sacrifice of horses, of course, is something that we know was important in uh, the practice of Norse religion based on the testimony of numerous uh, different sagas as well as uh, external sources and uh, the witness of archaeology. Now, the swearing of oaths was also apparently important during the Yule festival. Uh, many sagas feature oaths being sworn at this time, and of course, in this culture, the oath is an iron-bound thing no matter what. Right, I mean, so already many of the central conflicts of the Norse sagas center around someone's iron-bound oath that ends up being a bad idea, but has to be fulfilled anyway. Like Brynhild's oath that she would never marry a man who knew fear. Or Ragnar Lothbrok's oath that he would conquer England with just two ships. But an oath sworn on Yule was extra sacred. Now this may remind you a little bit of New Year's resolutions, right? These are similarly oaths that are supposed to have a special force because they're sworn at about this time of year. But in this case, since oaths were taken so seriously in this culture, you have to think of it like a New Year's resolution that you could be punished by death for not fulfilling. So if the idea of swearing that you're going to lose 10 pounds by March sounds like a good idea, uh, and uh, you think that you'd be a little extra motivated if someone could kill you if in March if, you know, they broke into your house, made you stand on a scale and you hadn't lost 10 pounds, then perhaps you could try something similar. Sagas such as Herbar Saga Okhedrex and Sturlaug Saga Starfsama feature oaths sworn at a Yule feast. And in both of these cases, the oath sworn is about marrying or 
or sexually conquering in some other way a woman. And so Yule Feast may have had an especial association with that kind of oath. One interesting thing in particular is that uh, oaths, at least in one manuscript of Havrosago Akegelix and in one of the uh, the poems about Helgi in the Poetic Edda, which I'll also talk about a little bit more in a minute, involve touching a board that is brought into the proceedings uh, in order to make these oaths, like swearing on a Bible but swearing on a pig. So in the Poetic Edda, there are three poems about the hero named Helgi, and one of these, Helga Krita Hjorvar Sonar, the saga of Helgi, son of Hjorvar, the one that does not connect him to the Volsung family, uh, says that on the evening before Yule, his brother Heaven was riding, and he encountered a woman who was either a troll or a witch riding a wolf using snakes for reins. This is also something we see at uh, Baldur's funeral and in some art from the Viking Age, this, this trope of evil women riding wolves using snakes as reins. And she asked if she could go along with him for a while, and he refused, but when he refused her, she said that he would pay for this that night when men were swearing their oaths at Yule, because this was Yule Eve. Well, he goes in to the feast at Yule, and a boar is brought in, and men are swearing their oaths, and Heaven, under the influence of the curse this woman has put on him, puts his hand on the boar and swears that he will take his brother Helgi's lover, Svova. Well, rather than fulfill this oath, which of course he's obligated to fulfill if he remains in the kingdom, he leaves, goes into self-imposed exile, but sometime later his brother Helgi tracks him down and asks him why he fled. Heaven tells him about his oath, but Helgi says, actually, this is convenient. I'm about to fight a duel, and I know that I might die. And if I die, I would rather leave Swova to my brother than wander about where she's going to end up, perhaps fall into the hands of my enemies. Uh, he says something interesting at the beginning of stanza 33 here. Sakas egi thu, son munuverta ulmol heaven, okor begya. Don't worry about it, basically. The words spoken while drinking or oaths made while drinking ulmol will be true heaven for us both so oaths made while drinking especially during yule are especially important especially sacred and during this winter season i'm hoping that your oaths and resolutions prove good and true and i hope that whatever holiday you celebrate as the as the days get longer and the nights get shorter that it's a wonderful holiday full of joy and peace for you and from beautiful Colorado, I'm wishing you Blit Legion.